Hello, welcome, very nice to be here, blessings. This is uh, exciting, I love doing these sessions with all of you, there's a lot of people on this call, so again, very welcome. It also looks like quite a few of you are new to this, so that's exciting. There's, uh, there's an aspect of your consciousness, your awareness, your walking around space, your perception, that he doesn't really get educated uh, well enough or doesn't really know where to get answers sometimes. And quite often we make assumptions about what a truth is for us, uh, what isn't true, what's real, what's not real. And in that context, one of the things that we virtually never do is ask the question, how do I know what I know? And where did I get this information? And is the information I have valid for me? We virtually never um, assess or step back or really take a look at, in a way, how did I get here? And what I know now that I'm here, does it work for me? And is it in present time? Is it real? Is it useful? Or is it really baggage that I carry around in my backpack that I've accumulated over years in kind of existing? So one of those topics uh, particularly a lot of people who are playing in a spiritual game um, have is we have a tendency to begin to want to know more. We wish to experience ourselves in a whatever spiritual means and we wish to kind of find out more about ourselves. And in that space, we have a tendency to listen to what other people say, uh, what other people know, and kind of sounds right. And so we, uh, we take it on, we accept it, we begin to hold on to it. And what happens more often than not, it's not held on to examine as if it's real or not real. It's like, oh, that's interesting. And then it gets pushed to the side, and then another piece is said, and somewhere else on the path another piece is said, and all of a sudden we arrange it in such a way that it's now truth. Oh, this is how it works. And it's a very interesting way that all unfolds. But for a lot of people today, kind of waking up, I say that really kindly, beginning to have a sense of themselves, actually beginning to say, I want to know more. What we've had available throughout history is really uh, a lot of disconnected information, a lot of valid information, a lot of information that's not necessarily valid, but the information that's even valid, does it work for me? And when I don't know the answer to that, I don't know the answer to that. So, but as in this process of where so many are really waking up, beginning to ask more questions, beginning to be more curious, beginning to have a sense of themselves, there is a large body of information that is being made available. An awful lot of it is in forms that are called channeling. But how do you know whether the person who's channeling somebody has really got it together or doesn't have it together? But it sounds good quite a bit. And in that context, quite often all we're doing is getting more information piled on top of the old information, but there's not necessarily a structure or a set of mechanisms for a person to discern. Is this accurate for me? And does this information have value to me? 
And can I begin to use it to navigate my life into well-being? And so I've been kind of really fortunate over the years in kind of playing in all those places and then having this uh, sense of awareness of knowing myself and then in the space of knowing myself, what's true, what's not true, how do the pieces go together? How does this piece fit into that piece? And it's been really quite an exciting journey. It's not about believing anything. It's like trying it out. So one of these pieces is around a question about dimensions. People ask questions about, well, what are dimensions? How do they work? How do I get into the 85th segment of the 14th dimension where I read a book and they said that was really cool. Well, what does that mean? It's really, but it was really cool. So, but so, what I'd like to do is give you a piece of information that is simply another piece of information. It may be absolutely your truth, it may be interesting, and I'm going to set it over here and pay attention to it as I gather more information. But what I'd like to do is kind of give you a, even a little fuller perception of what are dimensions, how they work, how do I know if they're correct for me, and can you give me a little broader base to begin to discern, is this my truth? So if that's acceptable to you, Let's see if we can begin to make some sense of this. And as we get to the ending point, let's see if you can shift from a third dimensional reality, I'll explain that in a moment, into a fifth dimensional reality, which is really all about almost a single word of well-being. So let's see what we can do. From this place <clears throat> that we experience ourselves, where we gathered all of our information, where we kind of play, is generally referred to as the third dimension. So just hold that as a fixed point for a second. But dimensions are really not just something that you can put in a box in a manner and say, okay, this is the truth, although we're going to call it a box in a second. But it depends on your point of attention. It depends on the filter you're looking through. So for example, if we were all looking at the ocean on a really great sunset standing right on the sand, <clears throat> some people would just simply say, wow, look at the ocean, look at the environment. How does this feel? Look at this whole presentation of the beautiful sky, the clouds, the earth, the water flowing into the earth. And that would be their perception of a circumstance. We won't call it a dimension, a situation. But the person standing right next to you views it through a different filter. They're a chemist. And as their curiosity is all about the chemist, they say, wow, water. H2O. And did you know, and it's really interesting, and in a manner of speaking, their enthusiasm about their reference point never sees the sunset in their experience where we're standing here right now. And a third person standing there viewing it basically looks at it from the standpoint of a, of a biologist and says, yeah, isn't that great? And all the fish and all the bacteria and the sponges, and they never see the sunset either from that particular filter. It's the same way with dimensions. There is, it's as if you were standing looking and everybody's got different filters they look through. If you were a physicist right now, an astrophysicist, you would be, fascinating looking at dimensions 
from interesting perspectives, but if you were to listen to an astrophysicist about dimensions, it's like, okay, whatever he said, she said, it doesn't add up at all. And if your perception of dimensions is six, simply something called the third dimension, and if I say, well, what does that mean? It's, well, it has length, width, and height. Well, actually, that's not a dimension at all. That's a definition of form. Form is measured in a measurement. And so everything you see, the tree, the chair, the box, that's called form. That's not a dimension. That's the first piece of information. So as you begin to start to ask, what is a dimension? Or what is, how, how do I get into being happy? from this place that I am not happy? Well, that's really the best question you could ask about a dimension. Because in the nature of where we're playing as spiritual folks, it would be maybe interesting to understand how the astrophysicist gets to that. But I'm not that interested in that. But I can allow that person real very much to have that point of view. It might even be a fascinating point of view to listen to. But your point of view, I'm going to make an assumption, is much more like standing on the beach, watching the sunset, finding this sensation, this feeling of, wow, isn't that beautiful? That's kind of where I've watched spiritual people who are saying, who am I? How do I fit? How do I navigate this? How do I begin to step into something bigger that I believe is there, but I don't know how to get there? So... Anybody know that kind of a question? So from that kind of question, let me define dimensions as three boxes. Oh, we could make it sixth dimension, seventh dimension, eighth dimension, but let's just deal with the third, the fourth, and the fifth as a box. Because when you begin to play with dimensions, as watching the ocean, enjoying the environment, knowing yourself, being engaged with you in a joyful place, when you begin to look at that third dimension, it doesn't really generate that great warm feeling. And let me explain why. So let's call the third dimension a box. And each one of these boxes has specific rules and structures to how they play out. We could kind of call it a game. Each one of these dimensions is very much a game. But it's hard to call it a game when you play by the rules of the third dimension. So let me define this in a way going back to length, height, and width, three dimensions. That's the creation of form. And form is about you having experiences. It's the mechanisms that allow you to have experiences. The house, the chair, the tree, the building, the boat, the water held by the banks of the river. That's all form. That's not dimension. It's the props. It's the backdrops. It's the setting for you as a spiritual being to have an experience. But in this end, it exists in the third dimension, form, fourth dimension, and fifth dimension. But the form looks different, takes on different characteristics. So in the third dimension, <coughs> the box is really very interesting, and it's the box that most of us play in. It's a box that is the rules are around separation, duality, conditionality. There is nothing in the third dimensional box that is unconditional. There's no unconditional love in the third dimensional box. So let me set that part up. You live right now in a third dimensional box, a fourth dimensional box, and a fifth dimensional box. You have access to all three of those boxes, but the rules are different. In the third dimensional box, one of the major conditionalities of that box 
is something that we take for granted. We never question. It's an absolute truth, end of discussion, and it's called time. Time is linear. Past, present, future, then you die. That's it. There's no other choice. That's how it is. Actually, that is not how it is. It is a configuration of the third dimensional game. So let's break down time and see if we can begin to make sense of how does the rest of the game actually play out because of time. If you think about yourself, the past is really generally important to most everybody for two reasons, and there's more, but the two reasons are in my past, they told me if I do this, that, and the other thing here, I will be successful in my future. And so you basically begin to follow what they said. And for the context here, we're going to call the they, the mom, dad, teacher, minister of our experience to this state. Mom, dad, teacher, minister, they. In that process, there is another aspect that we are actually more concerned about, although we don't wish to pay much attention to it, and that is, I didn't like what I did here, how I experienced myself, what happened in my past. I don't want it ever to happen again in my future. And so when you put those two configurations, they said I would be successful, or they said this is right or wrong or good or bad, some of the other aspects of the third dimensional box, right, wrong, good, bad, should, shouldn't, is the structures. How do you live your life? I pay attention to what's right or wrong or good or bad or should or shouldn't. So the mom and dad teacher minister basically says to you as a little kid growing up, I love you. I'm really on your side. I want you to be the best because that's really where the intention of all mom, dad, teacher ministers are. But from that point on, they begin to create you in their image. What I mean by that is, we don't talk to those people over there, we talk to these people over here. We go to this church, we don't go to that church. We, hang, we eat these kind of foods, we don't eat those kind of foods. We go to this type of enjoyment in theater and movies, we read these kind of books, we don't read those kind of books. I love you, I want the best for you. So what happens to us, how do we begin to navigate this world that we're playing in. And again, the rules are linear time, past, present, future, and then follow the rules, good, bad, right, wrong, should, shouldn't, and pay attention to what we tell you. That we is really a little larger they because it's the we of walking around. It's the we of engaging with friends. It's the we that we read that provides us the newspaper. It's the CNN and the Fox News, etc., etc. So we begin to figure out how to navigate our lives to a great extent based on what they tell us is correct. Anybody know that place? There's another part of you, though, that is uh, an interesting part. It's the you that knows who you are. It's that internal guidance system in the heart. It's the little kid that you look into their eyes at six months old, at a year old, and you can kind of see forever. And then you come back to see them at three years old, and that glint in their eyes isn't quite the same. And one of the reasons for that is that little kid, think about it, it knows, comes into a body, it knows nothing about this physical space in a manner of speaking. It doesn't know mommy, daddy. It doesn't know chair, tree. It doesn't know right and wrong. 
it just begins to navigate around and have fun exploring. And then the mom, dad, teacher, minister begin to say, here's the truth. It's in that space where we begin to give up our seniority, a really big word, seniority. And it's not that we give it up or argue. We don't, we say, mom, dad, teacher, minister, you're the big one, I'm the little one. Okay, whatever you say. And we begin to put on their clothes. And the more we put on their clothes, the less we begin to wear our clothes. We simply begin to accept this is how it works. But the process of accepting this is how it works, if you think back, many times didn't feel very good. I didn't, I didn't like that food they told me I had to eat. I don't feel good around these people that I'm supposed to be with. I don't like how that church feels when I'm supposed to be talking to the Creator. Somehow or another, the internal guidance system isn't aligned with the external third dimensional world. So let's go back to the rules. Conditionality is this is how you do it. In the third dimension, words that are very prevalent are always and never. But in always and never, there's not a whole lot of flexibility. So if you always do this and it doesn't feel good and it's not producing and you want to be a piano player, but the family wants you to be a doctor, lawyer, dentist, it doesn't feel really good. And so have you ever been in that space? So the box, linear time, right, wrong, good, bad, should, shouldn't, duality, separation, and then something called fear comes into the game very strongly. Fear has been in the game for a really long time. But all of a sudden, I don't like doing this, but I would like to do what I want to do. But if I do that, I'm going to upset those. And so we begin to create this conditionality. There's not a lot of freedom in conditionality. There's not a lot of permission to jump off the cliff and fly when you know you can, but they tell you you can't. And quite often the light begins to be duller and duller and duller in that spiritual experience in a physical body. There's another piece to this also that is very challenging in the rules, past, present, future, you die. But when you really basically look at it, the majority of the time spent is in the past, worrying about or hoping or remembering or trying to figure out what did I do once upon a time to make it work now. Or I hope I don't make a mistake. I hope they don't get upset. I hope in the future they don't yell at me. I don't embarrass myself. That's where most of my observation of the person walking around on the street, any city in the world, is coming from. Really kind of past and future. There is a present time moment in the third dimension, but we call it a reactionary present time moment. And what that means is, I hope this thing that I keep putting my attention on doesn't show up in my future. And then one day in present time, it shows up in your future. And that moment is kind of a holy mackerel moment. It's like, oh wait, this isn't good. This isn't supposed to be happening. You're in present time, but very much a reactionary present time, pushing against, trying to figure out how to get out of, how to change the story, this isn't good. To a great extent, that's what the third dimensional box is made up of. Now, there's lots of good things. I did this in the past and I'm really excited about it and I'll make it happen again in the future. But in that space, there begins to be a change. When you're excited about something, you are not in linear time anymore. You're in one of five configurations of present time. 
So there's that reactionary present time where it's like, oh my God, this isn't good. And you're in reaction. You're not paying attention. You're not enjoying yourself, definitely. And you're trying to figure out how to fix something, reactionary present time. But there's a, another aspect of present time. And you spend time in this often. And it's the place where you just, here I am. It's like right now, you're very much in present time. You're not thinking about tomorrow or dinner tonight. You're pretty much right here. This present time, we're going to call this a fourth or fifth dimensional present time. So let me define the box in a very simple way in fourth dimension and then give you a lot of information about the fourth dimension. Fourth dimension, in a way, is very simple in this context of the dimension. There are three things that allow fourth dimension to be very different than third dimension. In this box, this set of rules and structures to play this game, the first aspect of it is present time. I am here. I'm not in the past or the future. I'm right here. I might be thinking here. I might be worried here, but I'm really clear that I'm here. I'm not holding my attention in, oh God, what happens if type of space. I'm right here. And when you're right here, instead of being in a reactionary mode, third dimension, in this present time mode, you have something available to you here, fourth, fifth dimension, that you do not have in third dimension. And that's called choice. Here, you can ponder, mm, would I like spaghetti tonight or would I like the steak? I have choice. I'm in present time. I'm considering options. I'm not worrying about consequences. I am considering and choosing. Choice, very big deal. You play at it often in this space. Sometimes you play at it combined with the, I'm worried about, oh my God, if I do this, here's a consequence in my future. You're in present time, you're in a fourth dimensional thinking through, but you have those emotions, which we'll get to in a minute, and that heaviness and that, oh, I don't know what to do, kind of worriedness or fear that plays into this space. But in real terms, fourth dimension, present time, choice. All right, I'm going to choose the spaghetti. The third word is a really big one. And it's an odd word. The odd word is paradox. What paradox means is what was true a moment ago may not be true this moment, and what was false may not be false in this moment. If you're playing in a third dimensional world of always and never, he's always going to be bad. She's never going to be truthful. I'm not going to ever talk to that one again, ever. There's not a lot of choice and there's not a lot of paradox. Everything remains the same. 25 years after knowing this person that's never going to change, they show up on your front porch and you say, I know who you are, you're a bad person, get off my porch, 25 years later. Never going to change. But in this fourth dimensional space, you can say, I know who you are. I remember you stole money from me and how can I help you because you're on my porch 25 years later for some purpose. So the always and never goes away. The ability to say, I know you, and how can I be of assistance? In that space, there creates a level where a lot of people who walk around with guilt and blame always and never have a choice to basically say, you know, 25 years ago, I stole some money from you and I've regretted it all my life. It's the worst thing I've ever done. I've been guilty. I've punished myself for all this time. And I finally come to understand that I can live in a fourth and fifth dimensional world. And so I've come here to say, I'm sorry. Here's your $25 back. I hope I didn't cause you a lot of discomfort. And I am now going to dust off my sandals and walk away. I'm going to simply allow this 
guilt that I hold to be done. At the same time, you can say, I know you, come in, sit down, have tea, let's talk. And you realize that person sitting in front of you is not the same person of 25 years ago. Now pause here for a minute. Is there anybody in your reality that's never going to be good? They're always going to be bad. If you saw them on your porch, you would definitely throw them off. Think about it. Is it possible that they may have changed? But the bigger question is, who has the rock in her backpack? Who's the one who is carrying around the resentment, the animosity, the very bad feelings that have sat there for so long that it's become a condition and all people are bad. They all steal. We know what those people over there are like. Is it possible that one always has turned into a, an opinion, a judgment, a belief, a set of habits that became the piece of information that guided what you know and how you know it. That hasn't been examined for 25 years. Is that possible? Now, take a breath because we're working. We're not just talking and listening. I am purposely putting my finger right in the middle of your backpack. Because in this shift from this third dimensional reality into this fifth dimensional reality, you can't take this baggage with you. You cannot exist in a fifth dimensional reality, we'll get to in a moment, in this space of blame and guilt and victim and punishment and jealousy and rage. And those are third dimensional conditions beliefs and habits. So the key piece to the third, fourth dimension is really, I have the ability to get into present time. I have the ability to examine my circumstance right now and choose to continue to carry the rock or not. And in this moment, because I have the ability to recognize what was true once may not be even important to continuing to carry in my backpack. Now, another breath. Now, the fourth dimension has a whole lot of additional character characteristics to it. And one of them is the fourth dimension is not physical. There are no trees, houses, and chairs in the fourth dimension. The fourth dimension is a thought realm. It's where you think in a manner of speaking. Now, what makes this a very interesting place is because gazillions of people have gone before you. And one of the things that happens in this fourth dimensional space is all the thoughts ever thought that did not materialize into a physical expression in the third dimension sit in the fourth dimension. Now, have you ever asked yourself the question, where does the thought that I just think go when I'm done thinking the thought? I, I know you think that often, but thoughts don't just go poof and are gone when you're done thinking them. And so it's in this fourth dimensional space, this dimension. But there's another characteristic that makes it very interesting. Why is it that very predominantly in the third dimension, based on ethnicity, nationality, culture, history, that I do this thing over and over and over and over because my great, 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 great did this thing and this is how we know ourselves. Wow. Can you hear the third dimension in that space? This is what we believe. This is what we do. This is how we cook the beef. This is how we engage with people. This is who we are. 
Can you see the rigidity, the lack of flexibility, no mobility, always and never? Now, when it gets to the fourth dimension and you begin to recognize that the key to the fourth dimension of thoughts is thoughts thought that never got turned into a reality. On one end, on the really heavy, ugly end, incest, rape, murder, imposition, slavery, domination, the list runs out. How many times have you had a thought that was hateful, that was vicious, that was mean, but didn't act on it? Now, this is where it gets really interesting. That thought never fully left your space. But in the fourth dimension, it's not physical. And what does happen is all of the other thoughts like your thought now begin to magnetically align themselves like strings of thoughts all woven together. Now, I'm pointing to the worst of the worst. Oh, another end of that stick in the fourth dimension where butterflies and babies and isn't it cute and, oh, I love looking at the ocean. Thoughts, lighter thoughts, airier thoughts, less dense thoughts. I really love this postcard. I would love to go to the ocean, but somehow I never got to the ocean. But I have the thought of what it's going to be like if I get there. Now again, everybody take a breath because I have my finger in your backpack. Now this has a whole nother piece. Remember I said at the beginning, the biologists looking at the ocean, you looking at the ocean, the chemists looking at the ocean. Fourth dimension has lots of characteristics to it. But the Catholic Church actually presents the fourth dimension in a very interesting and relatively accurate presentation. It says there's a hell and there's a heaven and there's a purgatory. Now, what do you think hell is as you really begin to consider that? Now, I know you've thought a lot about this, but hell is one of those words and thoughts and possibilities that we all bump into somewhere throughout our experience, but we have no idea what the heck it is. And I really don't know what to do with it. And it's a scary thing, and I, I guess if somebody must know about it, because a whole lot of people talk about it, but it's a little bit frightening. I don't, I, I hope I'm not going there. There's no instructions on how not to go there, really, but I hope I'm not going there. Now, another breath. There was numbers of studies that have done in prisons. And in those studies, one of the questions is ask, how do you sleep? And consistently, the answer is not very well. And so why is that? Because as I go to sleep, I have bad dreams. Well, how, what are your dreams like? Oh, they're like murder and rape and incest. So what, what are you in here for? Well, murder, rape, and incest. So that person who holds thoughts, you, me, we all hold thoughts. In a third dimensional space, we think these thoughts, but in a fourth dimensional space, the thought is actually kind of brought into life. Dreams. Do you remember that? law of attraction that says what you put your attention on, I, the universe who absolutely adores you, will provide for you. Except the universe doesn't really speak English, French, and Spanish very well. What, that, what the universe does, it understands vibrations of thought. 
And it's in those vibrations of butterflies and lovely gardens. And you hold that thought and it begins to materialize into a deeper thought. And it's like, I can make that garden. And the garden comes from that fourth dimensional thought form into a physical expression in your backyard. But in that space where I think murder, rape, and incest, and murder, rape, and incest, and these are really bad people, and they don't deserve to have this, and I know better third dimension, linear time, conditionality. And in that person's case, they went and committed the murder, rape, incest. And now they're incarcerated. Did they ever change their thinking structure? Are they now even more guilty possibly or blaming somebody else? The answer is very much yes. And so as they think those thoughts over and over and over in that cell, and then they try to go to sleep with all that vibrating in their physical realm, where do you think they go based on what they think? It's very magnetic when you begin to play in the astral space. Now, most, and I kind of hear this lightly. This is not, uh, I'm watching some go, oh my God, that's why. No, be nice to yourself. I'm going to give you an answer to how to begin to step out of that, hopefully in a few minutes. So that fourth dimensional space is a place, it's a thought form. And all the thoughts ever thought basically create this world. One of the things about the world that all the thoughts ever thought creates, it's the emotional body of the consciousness of the being that we call Gaia, the earth herself. It is a field, vibrational field. It's the emotional body. It's not the emotional body she chose to create. It's the emotional body we have created for her. All our thoughts ever thought that have never turned into expressions. Many of them are very beautiful. Many of them are very neutral. Kind of think about it as a scale of making it up one to eight. Eight being really fun and enjoyable thoughts and one being really heavy thoughts. So back to my question, what is hell? It is that place where you cannot get out of these heavy thoughts and you carry them over and over. And then for many, they die. And in the next incarnation, it is very possible that that's the space where oh, karma, got to clean out that stuff. There's another aspect to the fourth dimension that is very interesting. This is an aspect of where people talk about, I want to know about beings. Oh, well, there's the ascended masters, the archangelics, the lords of light. They all exist, but that's a fifth dimensional conversation in a few moments. It's the other beings that we really want to begin to be aware of. Because remember the mom, dad, teacher, minister who said, this is the truth. And you went, okay, never to be examined as if it was a reality for you personally. Beings of consciousness. Let's say there's a, a, a line and way over here on one end of the line, fourth dimension, there is something called multiple personalities, schizophrenia, other names. That grouping of people is really interesting because you're possessed. Another one of those Catholic church words, you're possessed. So let me ask you, are any of you possessed? Here, let me answer the question. Absolutely, yes, you are. Now, I'm only pointing to one end of the stick. It's really the other end of the stick that you are interested in. But let me play this out because this place called purgatory is a very interesting place. Fourth dimension. Let's say you're a, a person that is 
a no let's not talk about you let's talk about a person his life didn't work for them they're angry they're really upset they are fixated on a set of thoughts a set of beliefs a set of understandings and there is nothing else but that in whatever form it is and they are consumed by that and then they die mechanics of the fourth dimension is in that consuming of those thoughts and emotions the beliefs and the habits the person dies a lot of times well, another subject but death is not what we generally are told death is something really quite wonderful and very different but in this case the person dies let me step back when somebody generally dies they've gone and had a life and it's up and down and it's been their life and they they die being really simple as they step out of the body they get freed up and they look up manner speaking and there's creator there's grandma there's all this beautiful white light which is a whole nother story and they go home what the catholic church would call heaven but the person who is so fixated on circumstance they basically are looking down and when they step out of the body they are still in that same vibrational field and they don't look up and they really aren't bad people but they're so fixated they don't look up manner of speaking and so they stay in this stuck space kind of called purgatory or fill in the blank whatever you want but how does that play out in relationship to another person so this person who just died is very angry very fixated on uh, the government isn't doing it right they're stealing from me they're really uh, doing bad things fixation and then there is this person at work that goes to the bar at night because they're really upset they don't like their job they're really upset with the government it's not doing the right thing it's really bad and they have a couple drinks this is another aspect of a big piece of how the whole game works law of attraction what you put your attention on I the universe will provide for you but the universe understands vibrations and so it says if you're vibrating and really hating the government and on 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 I will give to you what you're asking for and so here's this being that's not looking up out of the body and here's the person at the bar identical thinking patterns being at the bar is a little bit out of their body drunk whatever and the other being steps right in and basically doesn't know that it's even dead but it now is functioning just like it was before it doesn't have any recognition that it's in a different body no none and all of a sudden that person has a different personality multiple personality schizophrenia so that's kind of how one end of that works but the other end is the one that we're interested in because it's the other end of the story that is where the mom dad teacher minister in their love for you basically said here's the truth this is how we do it this is right wrong good bad you should you shouldn't and you say okay you step out of your space in that moment and their truth slips right into that space not meant to be bad simply meant to be helpful but the question is is it your truth does it work in your body does their vibration in this answer make sense to you
all of those places where we generally walk around, I'm not okay, I don't deserve, I'm not a good person, I'm never going to be smart enough, I'm not going to succeed. One of my truths, 100%, is that circumstance is somebody handing you a gift from their point of view. Or they're just really angry. Why are you so stupid? And they climb right into the center of your head. And they push you out in that circumstance. Has that ever happened to any of you? Invalidated by somebody else? Embarrassed by somebody else? Spoke to inappropriately by somebody else? And then you said, what's wrong with me? It's right here that it is let me tell you another of my truths. It is impossible to be not okay. Impossible. You as a spiritual being in that body, impossible to screw up this lifetime on your own. But what we do is simply say, okay, whatever you say. And we get moved out of our alignment, our truths that we haven't even been able to bring into reality yet. And that truth begins to direct the flow. So this fourth dimensional space is really very interesting. It's the astral plane. It's the thought forms. But the piece that allows this to be very much a success is when you recognize when I'm in present time, I have choice. And part of my choice is what might have been true once upon a time may not be true any longer and or false any longer. It's the fourth dimensional space where you begin to have a sense of yourself, if chosen, that begins to say, who am I? How would I like to navigate? How would, what do I believe? What is my truth? Now, I'm not selling you a thing here at all. I'm just gonna make a comment. Part of mastering alchemy, what if you could create a def point of definition right at the edge of your aura that says everything from that point to my heart is me and everything on the other side is Shakespeare's theater to entertain me. Boy, that takes away an awful lot of responsibility for trying to navigate out there versus just kind of allowing yourself to watch it and choose whether it makes sense to you or not. What if you could be grounded? What if you could view from the center of your head? What if you could begin to engage with that internal guidance system where you begin to realize what's your truth? What if you could create a platform for yourself where this is the place of starting to step into the fifth dimension? See, the fifth dimension is all about well-being. Words like trust and safety, anger, rage, resentment, they don't exist in the fifth dimension. It's too harsh of a vibration you never get thrown out of the fifth dimension. You fall out because it's like, oh, I'm angry again. You, but when you're happy, very different story. So what if in that field of choice, opportunity, and you begin to say, what if I, how would I like to construct myself? Have you ever asked that question? How would I like to present myself? In the fifth dimension, the vibrations Anger, rage, resentment doesn't exist. But what does exist are vibrations like well-being, appreciation, gratitude, certainty, capable, seniority, humility, respect, dignity, laughter, kindness. How do those words feel? Anger, rage, judgment, bad, good. How do those words feel? How will, 
where would you choose if you could be in present time on your side of the edge of your aura, grounded right here, able to choose and not be limited by the beliefs, the thoughts, constructs of your past. Now take another breath. We're actually doing a lot of work, but what if So let's play for a moment without really defining the box any bigger than the feeling, the alignment, the vibration of well-being. Oh, there's far more, but what if we could do that? Take a breath, sit back for a moment. And would you just like yourself? Oh, just kind of get into that vibration. I like me. I'm okay. We're really not going to put any attention on what's in the backpack from here on. Just, I'm comfortable. I'm sitting in my chair. I'm happy. I'm pleased with myself. I, I like me right here. No work. Can't fail. Impossible. And would you just bring your attention into the center of your head, kind of right behind your eyes. Have your eyes open for a minute. Right behind your eyes, just bring your attention inside you. And from behind your eyes, would you just notice the room? Without going to the room, I'm here. The room is right there. The wall's right over there. I see it. I'm right here. Now just notice that part first. Very simple, but just notice it. See what generally happens in who am I and what am I about and how do I think? We think in the past and the future very automatically without even recognizing it. We, instead of sitting here and recognizing the room is still here. I asked you to see it a couple of seconds ago. It's still here. It didn't go away. Here I am. But in the past and in the worry and in the thinking and what should I do? Room disappears. Gone. It's not even theirs. You miss the ocean entirely. It's standing right at the edge. But I, I didn't see the ocean. I'm consumed in what happens if. And is that... I hope they don't find out that I did this once upon a time. Now, another breath. Now, all I did was just change your attention point. See, a moment ago, you were happy. I like me, pleased with myself. At least you, I moved your attention to that opportunity. And then I moved your attention to, oh, God, I stole the candy bar, and I hope they never find out. How did that feel? Just beginning to put your attention on the past, not even a particular subject, just the past. Now, without making this serious, would you observe without being the effect? Here I am, there's the wall, my eyes are open. Is there something in your past that you would really rather not talk about or hope nobody else noticed. Now, my question to you is, is there? Now, can you just be aware of it without pulling the emotion into the body? Yep, I stole the candy bar when I was five years old. It doesn't really feel good, but I'm not going into the energy of the emotion. Just notice that thing. Now, would you take a breath and would you just bring your attention back to seeing what's in front of you, right over there. I'm here. I'm just observing the wall, or the, the doorknob, the window right over there. I'm here. There's the window. Now, again, I'm here. There's the window. I just noticed right from that space. I'm here. There's the doorknob. 
Now let's say, let's take it one more. I'm here. There's the doorknob. This is really a silly thing he's having me do. Kind of notice if there's a little amusement with there's the doorknob. Or can you let yourself have a little bit of amusement? How silly this guy's game is he's playing, but a little amusement. Now, would you recognize right where you are right here and without changing it, without any movement, without any shift in emotion, would you be aware of you stole the candy bar when you were five or whatever your issue is. It's over there. It's in the past. You're right here. Yep, that happened. How, whether my fault, somebody else's fault. I never figured that out. I'm right here. Would you just notice being right here? The past is over there, whatever that means. And I'm right here. And right here, what if you could choose a word, but not necessarily a word, a feeling, a vibration. Here I am and I'm happy. Oh, I'm enjoying myself or I'm amused. Well, this feels good. Pick one, whatever. And would you notice the feeling of well-being, whatever the word is you're looking at, would you notice how that word you're using, how does that feel? And then notice how it feels. I'm going to move you away. I'm going to bring you back. I'm going to ask you to feel the same feeling in a, in a moment. But would you move your attention to a vibration of strength? What would strength feel like in your body? Now, we're just playing, so kind of make it up. Not lifting weights strength, but I'm strong. I'm present. I'm right here. There's a sense of strength. I'm capable. Okay, we're just playing. What does that feel like? Now, would you be aware of what this feels like? I'm going to ask you to come back to it in a moment. But right here, would you bring your attention back to that first feeling, the I like me feeling or whatever it might have been? Can you feel it again, just like you did a moment ago? Now, would you just bring your attention to strength and notice how that feels? We're just playing. It's not important what we're doing. We're just playing. How does strength feel? Now, play here. Could you be a little stronger? Actually, kind of in, yes, I can do this. It's kind of a, yes, I can. Uh, just play. But also notice this is where the rational mind begins to come in. It says, this is stupid. This, this doesn't, what is, this has nothing to do with being spiritual. What's this guy talking about? Th that's the rational mind. It's real happy to talk you out of feeling good, having strength. Yeah, another breath. Now, would you just relax? Would you notice what relaxed feels like? Now, here's where a lot of this all comes together. And then we'll come to a stopping point. Thoughts are electrical and emotions are magnetic. First piece of information. Another one of those things that may have been questioned, but never really got a good answer. What's the difference between an emotion and a feeling? 
and if you took it further, a sensation. What happens is you have this rational mind, what you think from, how you navigate your third dimensional world, how you determine where to go to get good information. Uh, am I okay? Can I go over there without getting yelled at? Uh, can I take this job even though I don't know enough to do it? That's the rational mind. That's Its job is to keep you safe and have you fit in. Here's the first challenge with that. Right where we're playing, I like me, there's strength, yes, I can do this, well-being, graciousness, kindness, that's not fitting in. You see, you don't fit in when you, I love me, I'm having the best time, this is a kick in the ass, I just read this great book, I had so much fun, take that to work. How does it work at work? See, the third dimensional world is very unconscious of being unconscious. It functions in past and future and worry and fear. And it's taught by mom, dad, teacher, minister, all wonderful people because they had a mom, dad, teacher, minister that taught them. They just did the best they could. But they too are in fear and worry and doubt and lack. Key vibrations of good, bad, right, wrong. Look around how much of the world is in that third dimensional box. How much of the world is in, I love myself, I really like me. I'm holding a vibrational platform of well-being, certain, gracious, kind, respectful, a sense of dignity, a sense of yes, I can. What do you think the universe that adores you is going to do with that? What they're going to do with that is they're going to basically begin to have you have an awareness that that is a feeling and feelings are generated from the heart. So where are emotions generated from? Emotions are creations of the rational mind. The rational mind is all about making sure everything kind of stays okay, status quo, and that you don't upset people and it doesn't upset people and I've got to do it right and I can't do it wrong. Rational mind. And it learned through eons of time that if I do it this way, I please those that I want to feed me. And if I do it that way, I get thrown out of the cave. Hmm. So the rational mind needed to create a construct a measuring gauge to determine how angry are they really. And so it created a vibrational field that we call emotion. Emotions have edges to them. Anger, resentment, embarrassment, jealousy, humiliation, go on and on and on. They're all feelings but they have edges that are generated into the space that we would call them as emotions. But well-being, joy, happy, respect, dignity, laughter, there's no edges. This fifth dimensional space is where we're pointing to is really a doorway a box that allows you to step into a space that begins to feel good. But it's in that fourth dimensional space of choice that as you get into present time and you begin to recognize that truth that I've been carrying around, that I've turned into a habit and a belief, doesn't align with my feeling. I am okay. Is this making any sense? 
So it's really not so much about understanding a dimension as it is understanding the game that is played in the box that's called the dimension. And if you just simply be the spectator on the ocean admiring the sunset and the beauty of the dancing light, this is the space where you begin to recognize what I know, how I exist, the places that don't feel good, all of the stuff I've done wrong, whatever that means, that's hidden in my backpack because I hope nobody ever knows. What if you could step into present time, begin to build that platform in the fifth dimension and recognize that I was embarrassed in fourth grade because I had two different color socks on and I've been embarrassed all my life about how I dress. What if you could just recognize I'm not in fourth grade and this has really no value to me? In a real clear manner that you say this is something that's in the backpack from my past. And what if you could go buy the shirt that you really like, but they don't think it fits for you? Because we're, we, we're, we're a this, and you're wanting to be a that, and that makes me really uncomfortable. Have you ever had people around you that express themselves in that manner? Now, let's come to a stopping place, but right here, would you recognize you're sitting in a chair? Would you take a breath? Would you be aware from the center of your head, looking through your eyes? And what vibration would you like to choose for this moment? You can have any of them, feelings or emotions. Choose. And if you choose with a little, emotion, a little bit of amusement, you'll feel the smile in the center of your heart beginning to express itself. If you allow it long enough, it will be an amusing laughter. How do you choose? Now, would you take another breath and would you choose another vibration? Would you be pleased with yourself for no reason other than I like me in this choice that I just made? Wiggle your toes, kind of pat your thighs, be amused at yourself. There is much more to this and yet, it's so simple. The challenge is it's not necessarily easy to shift from I'm not okay to this is a kick in the ass. I'm having a great time every moment of the day. Doable? Absolutely. Challenging? A little bit, but nowhere near a level of challenge that prevents this state of well-being. So with that said, let's stop right there. I hope this was helpful. I had a good time. And uh, let me turn this over to Roxanne. And uh, I'm, hap I want to, I'm interested in your questions. I'd like to know what you just experienced. Did you have an aha? Would you like to know how to get more of that? It's not too hard. And let's go from there. Roxanne, do you exist? Yes, hello. If you would like to ask your question, you have to be logged in to go to webinar. I'm repeating these instructions because, because I see a lot of new names on the list here. And once you're logged in to go to webinar, you'll have a control panel and you there's a uh, field there with that's labeled questions. You type it in there and it pops up on my screen and I can ask it for you. And just to let you know, we're recording this. We give it to our helper tonight. She chopped it up cleans it up, and it will be in the free webinar library 
by Wednesday, this next Wednesday. So we would really also like to hear, like just like Jim said, hear wh what you experienced with the meditation, how it felt, any ahas or insights that you had. Jim, this first question is from Corrine, and she emailed this in. How do I trust the voice of intuition that can be so strong, yet at the same time extremely counterintuitive? Hmm. Counterintuitive meaning that it doesn't... Uh, it doesn't make sense to her. Well, uh, well, it doesn't make sense. Makes sense. <laughs> so what happens if you're living in that third dimensional reality and you got the mom, dad, teacher, minister all in your head saying, here's truth. And all of a sudden your intuition, this internal guidance system is saying, you know, this makes a whole lot more sense. The challenge is... I wish to do this. I wish to follow my intuition that when followed pretty much always brings you down on your feet wherever you choose to go versus am I going to upset them? And so the challenge is in the space where you start to bring your attention into what you want and all of the attention points from mom, dad, teacher, minister saying this is right, this is how you do it they're alive and well on your, in your body, on your body, in terms of yes or no's, emotions, and you start to move towards the intuition. And a lot of times that I'm going to get yelled at if I do this kind of thought or feeling comes up. And all that is, is I believed this and now I'm going to do something that I don't, I don't believe. Intuition says do this. The old truths that you've accepted say, no, that's not a good thing. And so the, the, the push and shove is in the simplest way, who are you and what is your truth? But going back to my first statement is we've moved through life accepting all kinds of things and we don't know, how do you know what you know? You've just accepted it and it hasn't been examined. And if you did examine it, how much of it would work for you today? And that's the push and shove. Jim, here is a comment from Lori Jean. Great exercise in pivoting from the lesser vibrations to the higher ones. And then I have a couple people asking about um, emotions and feelings. This first question is from Catherine. Please speak more about feelings and how, how they're different from emotions. This is Catherine from Phoenix. So uh, I'll say what I said again. If you, I'm going to try to keep it real simple. We, we can make it much more encumbered, but who wants that? In the real simplicity, in the space of assessing, is this my truth or not my truth? Just kind of in that sense of it, observation, emotions often have edges. A feel it. Anger, resentment, jealousy, judgment, uh, denial, how do they feel? Uh, well-being, laughter, happy, friendship, admiration, appreciation, gratitude, how do they feel? You know, it's kind of funny, put a handful of them in one hand and a handful of them in the other hand and move your hands up and down and one drops way down and one kind of floats up in the air. It's, this is very much about something I didn't talk about in regard to uh, physical form is density and heavy thoughts, put it in this context, fourth dimension, heavy thoughts, all of those heavy thoughts, they have a heaviness in the density. The other thoughts are lighter and fluffier and feel good. And so if you just use that as a frame of reference, and then begin to be in a place of, here I am, do you want to continue to carry this heavier thought? There's one more piece of information that might be useful, is useful, is let's say you have this, you did something when you were younger and you have a, and, it, and you got caught. You did something and you got caught at it and you felt guilty in the process. Every time you put your, and it was 25 years ago, 
Every time you put your attention on it, you feel guilty. But what happens is emotions and feelings only exist in present time. They do not exist in the past or the future. Meaning, as soon as you bring your attention to the event, you get guilty. But the reality is in present time, I, you put your attention, you stay in neutral, you put your attention on the event, and what you know is, I stole the candy bar and I got caught and it wasn't a fun thing. But the information of your past, every event in your past from present time is simply information and it does not have to have the same emotion attached to it. Emotions and feelings occur in present time. So when you get into present time, you begin to have some sense of a lot of the tools that are taught in Mastering Alchemy, and you're grounded and you're in present, and you begin to recognize my past is simply a huge state of information. Interesting, good, bad, useful, not useful, but here I am. And so does that guilt and the stealing of the candy bar at five years old, something that I choose to still feel guilty about? Does it have any value? And the answer in present time is no, it has no value. Okay, it was an event I learned not to steal candy bars again. It was a event that provided a useful piece of information and that's what it was. Do I need to keep referencing it? Do I need to hold myself accountable? Do I need to wear this as something that I never forget so I don't do it again? No, you're capable enough of saying, I don't steal candy bars again. It, was, it has no value to me. In present time, without the emotion, and from the point of curiosity, you're going to find that a great amount of the baggage that you hold in that backpack simply evaporates and has no emotional attachment to it at all. It just goes away. It has a lot to do with things like electricity and magnetism and adhesion, all things you'll learn about, but the emotion of a past event is an unnecessary thing to put your attention on as you remember a past event. That will become more interesting as you go along. Jim, here is a comment from Doreen. Happy tears. It's like it's about time. I've been waiting for this. I knew it was coming. Great. Happy to be of assistance. Is it true lighter thoughts are more magnetic than the denser ones? No, it is not. And in fact, to a great extent, it's the other way around because think about the density and the gravity and the, oh my God, this feels so bad. You know, I was so bad. You put your attention on, I was so bad. It becomes another whole piece of information is that you, thoughts are electrical, emotions are magnetic. You have a thought and then immediately you have a feeling and the feeling creates the magnetism. And then you go, I'm so bad, I'm so bad, I'm so bad, I'm so bad. It's like taking a, a wire and wrapping it around a steel ma a bar and you create this huge electromagnetic field. Do you run thoughts through your head more around how good I am or how bad I am? There's your electromagnetic field. Wherever, whichever was the one you spend more time in, you create electromagnetic fields. The happy beauty, wow, I love this mountaintop, and you keep running it through your awareness, all it does is generate those kind of happy feelings. You run, I'm not okay, I'm not okay, and you wrap that wire around it, have you ever realized how hard it is to get out of? I was bad and I, I'm probably going to always suffer from this. And you just keep talking to yourself over and over and over. There's your heavy magnetic field. That was the end. Okay, that's the end. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's really fun for me to kind of be intuitive and guess when you're finished and sometimes i'm not that intuitive and there's this long pause okay the next question is from frederick in greece if time and space move through me does that make me static 
or do I move too? Okay, so, so th this is a knowledgeable question that you're asking. This is not a random question. So for, there's a, uh, so this is not where we were just, but it's really related very much so. So one of the things is we think time and space are two different things. They are not. They are the same. Now there's time, if you, well, not purely. So time, uh, I'm gonna make this up, time is on a vertical axis, space is on a horizontal axis, and it spins. And there's really cool stuff about all that, but not for today. So time and space, when you begin to recognize yourself in a, that, that present time, fifth dimensional space particularly, here I am, I'm happy, I'm certain, I'm capable, I hear I am. In that here I am space, there's no, there is, there's you. You are the center of the universe right there is here I am. What happens at that point, all of your surroundings, your circumstances, your environment, all that is, is now moving through you. You don't move through time and space. In the third dimension, you keep looking at your watch and it's getting later and later and later and you're waiting for time to show up but you're kind of think you're walking you know you're moving through time but when you get into present time and you're able to hold this point of awareness you realize time and space moves through you when you begin to play in the fifth dimension and sixth dimension it's as if you're sitting there with a hundred television sets or, or uh, monitors sitting in front of you and every one of them has a different story. How would you like to choose your next moment? And it's all about attention points. Oh, I like that beach over there. And so you kind of turn your head and at that minute, that movie that's on that screen completely consumes you. You're, you are no longer aware of the other 99 screens. Think about it when you go to a movie you step out of life, you sit down in the chair, the movie comes on. Do you pay any attention to life or is there anything else going on besides the movie? And then it ends and you go, oh, wow, it's okay. <laughs> I'm moving my attention point now back to walking out of the theater monitor. So if you can think about it in real simple terms like that and you can manage yourself without the baggage, and with the amusement and with the curiosity and with a whole lot of information about how realms of consciousness work within the dimensions, think about them like a big hundred screens in front of you. What would you like to choose next? Over there, there's a horror movie. Over there, there is a lovely dinner that's sitting there really wanting to be eaten. What if you could get yourself in a, such a present time state that in real terms, that movie all of a sudden just surrounded you, just like the movie at the theater, but the meal was actually sitting on the table in front of you. You'll hear me refer to often is, as you begin to play with these tools and get into this space, you will hold out your hand and the apple will appear. And so, is that difficult? No. Is it challenging? Uh, yes. Is there a lot more information that is required? Yes. Is it complicated? No. Can you hold out your hand and allow the apple to appear? You can very much do that when there's no baggage in your backpack and particularly the nature of stepping out of more of the rational mind allows you to say, this is absolutely possible but the rational mind in a very uh, more complicated way, it, that's not part of the game. Uh, that's not how third dimension works. You can't, you can't do that. So we just, the rational mind just cuts off access. That's why stepping into the fourth dimension, the fifth dimension, managing yourself, looking through your eyes from the center of your head, even more so from the heart, the game changes. Rocks, rocks, that was the end. <laughs>
<laughs> Thank you. <laughs> this is a comment from Marifer. It was amazing tonight how I can change the emotion of the past and choosing to be in joy and love being in the present that I started laughing at myself. It was beautiful. Thank you. Perfect. Excellent. Good job. And then this question is from Nancy, who's in level two. My question was, am I choosing to carry the rock in my backpack when I choose to no longer associate with people, family, friends, who do not honor me and the spiritual path I have chosen? The aha moment was when you said I don't fit in. I'm okay with that, and it feels amusing to me now. I like me. I'm certain, capable, mostly present, and mostly happy. Thank you. Okay, well, wait, that was a question. The, the question is, yes, you're still carrying the rock in your backpack. See, the rock's in the backpack. And, and even though you say, I'm never going to talk to you again, the circumstances, the beliefs, the emotions, and thoughts that are all wound up to create that electromagnetic field, they still exist, right? Where you are holding on to them, but denying paying attention to them in the backpack. So just because the family's gone doesn't mean the circum the pain of the event of the family goes away. So that's in level two when you start using the fourth, fifth, sixth ray. You start to understand how to really apply the eighth ray, how to unravel that big spider web that is called the strings of thought, where you say, I'm not okay, I'm not okay, I'm not okay, and then something comes to validate it. And then you say it again and something else comes from another direction. You have all these thoughts that you've thought, remember I said they don't go away, they stay in that fourth dimensional thought realm and they begin to create connective points. And so if you go back and say, how many times have I been upset and angry and resentful and punished in my family and every one of those times I had thoughts about it? They're all there, they're still there until you realize, wait, this is baggage. This is not serving me right now. I don't live with that tribe anymore. Let them do what they're doing and enjoy their path while I simply go over here and play with my path. It's a point of really recognize I can clean this out. And when you begin to get happy, one of the things, and you understand the alignment of happy well-being, kind of where we played tonight, plus more pieces, all of a sudden, from certainty, you can say, I can let them be okay. I'm not playing that game anymore. And everything in the backpack related to that string of thought just simply evaporates, short circuits, dissolves itself. We have a very convoluted thought process of how we should be healing ourselves mentally, emotionally. And it's misery is optional. You do not have to sit and cry every time you begin to bring your attention back to events. That, that's therapy. Therapy, understand therapy was invented really in the 80s. I mean, really. Before that, you had James and Freud and concepts, but when you begin to have life, consciousness, people becoming conscious of being unconscious, Therapy was invented. Really good stuff. It was important all through the time. But there's another aspect here where you can get rid of that virtually instantaneously. It's from certainty. It's from knowing yourself. It's from recognizing that simply information that I don't have to attach an emotion to. And I can just let the information move along. I don't need to hold the emotion attached to it. That's when it all begins to change when you allow it. Jim, this next question is from Cherie. How can I make sure it's spirit advising me and not ego pretending to be spirit? Yeah, great question. So a topic for a whole nother day, but let me explain it this way and it's not gonna be fully complete for some of you, which is okay. So you think the rational mind is in your head. It is not. It lives in the first chakra. For the most part, people believe the first chakra in their spiritual growth, they've been told the first chakra is about the survival of the body. It is not. And the ego, whatever that is, 
is actually a hugely important part of you. You do not want to get rid of the ego. It'd be like chopping your leg off and then trying to navigate. But the wounded ego lives in the first chakra. And so the wounded ego is off balance. It basically works from the rational mind thinking life is terrible. It plays in the slice of the first chakra that is about the survival of the body. There is a slice. If you were to step at the edge of the cliff, the first chakra, the body through the first chakra would say, I really don't think you want to be here. Step back. You're making me nervous. That's the survival element, which is a sliver within the first chakra. Also, the part that makes it all so difficult is the first chakra is fragmented, broken, shattered, disconnected, unengaged in many components of its functionality. And so one of the things that really is, is an exciting piece of transition is in about the 20th session of level two Mastering Alchemy, Archangel Michael, Archangel Gabriel, uh, myself, you, and Kathumi, Ascended Master Kathumi, reconstruct the lower three chakras into a spherical orbs as they were originally meant to be, not kind of half-shaped uh, arcs and uh, in, in things like that. So it's in that uh, construction of that first chakra or the everything that comes about your well-being that at that point you the consciousness that's hearing me this part of you you begin to engage with both the higher self and the soul to heal the wounded ego the ego is extremely important to you and the ego will become very important to you as you begin to get into that light body construct, which is uh, very structural. Um, and the ego begins to be a very positive guiding force of consciousness in that recreated state. So hope that helps. Jim, this next one will be our last question for tonight. This is from Jan, level one. Could you please update us on the status of the three waves of light? How do those waves affect the third, fourth, and fifth dimensions? Great question. So in 2012, for those who haven't heard this part of the story, the, there was effectively, in my words, a new operating system put into consciousness. We were done with the third dimension. So uh, again, a very much bigger story, but the third dimension, the box, was uh, the door was closed on that. And one of the things that Metatron said, Archangel Metatron, in that configuration said, from this moment on, there will never be another child born into the structural box, my words, of the third dimension. They will not have the wiring of the third dimension. The game is over. The reality is the game is over for you. You are no longer either const uh, constrained by the third dimensional box. However, you believe you are. And so that fourth dimensional thought structuring is, is you say, well, look, I'm looking out the window. I see the tree, so I must still be in the third dimension. What is being said is the rigidness and the wiring patterns that in fact held you in that place were eliminated. However, we believe you're, we believe they're still in place. And so the average person continues to walk around, never questioning how I know what I know and is it still in present time? So a big piece of tonight was to say to you, it's not in present time. It doesn't even exist. And by beginning to hold your attention in this fourth dimensional space, that aspect of present time, choice and paradox, what you begin to find is you are in a fourth dimensional belief system that the third dimension exists. You are in a, the box of the fourth dimension, which is non-defined, uh, these are my words here simply, let me see if I want to say this correctly. The box 
as described to you, is simply present time, no attention to past and future other than observing it, choice and paradox. From those, from that configuration, the ability to look at your past and not have it still hardwired into the emotion is now in a situation where it just becomes information that I can choose to keep or not. No emotion. As you begin to get into these four, into these fifth dimensional platforms, certain, capable, gracious, commanding of my presence, seniority as in this is who I am, happy, it's in that construction, you're building a new frame of reference for yourself that allows you to choose much more freely in the fifth dimension well-being laughter and recognizing my past is just information that I no longer have to keep carrying around. It is that simple, but simple is not easy. To a great extent, virtually everybody coming out of that third dimensional awareness and now waking up with all the stuff in the backpack, it's my belief is like a freight train at 90 miles an hour. This is how it works. This is what's going to happen. And Jim's over here going, wait, just turn right. And, you know, and you're all screaming at me, wait, I'm going to crash. It's going to be bad. No, no, it's not. But the perception of the third dimension, of the train crashing, is still very much in the thought realm. So that's why we don't, in, in Mastering Alchemy and how the Archangelics all present all these pieces, it's amazing how in, incredible it all works, is there's no truth. There's not, none of this is presented as a truth. It's just do this, what happens? Okay, and that worked, do this, what happens? And pretty soon you just keep walking yourself along the path, putting on these different configurations because nobody has ever told you, for the most part, you're okay. Nor have they told you you're big, you're important, you're significant, and it's the reason you've come here is right now. And you're great, you're capable. Put yourself back together. Capable, certain, gracious, I like me. Angry, rage, resentful, I don't like me. Uh, put them both in each hand and which feels better. And that's the platform you're standing on at this minute. And the question is, how will you choose? So let's come to a stopping place. I'm going to uh, try, no, I'm not going to try. I'm going to, in these next series, next number of months, go back and do things like water dimensions. I, I used to do those, you know, in 2010, 12, 13, 14, and because everybody had heard it so many times, but you all, many of you haven't heard it. So I'm going to go back and begin to do some of these really fundamental pieces that allow you to start to perceive in a manner that you can choose more comfortably with information. So go away, play with these tools, Practice this allowing yourself to like yourself. Recognize emotions are with the rational mind's way of keeping you connected to a past which doesn't even exist anymore. So with all that said, go away, enjoy yourself wherever you are in the world. Blessings.